Thank you everybody for joining us today uh, at, uh, at our launch, at the Baha'i International Community's launch of, uh, of a report called Violence with Impunity, Acts of Aggression Against the Baha'i Community of Iran. Uh, we are honored today to have uh, Mr. Haider Bielefeld with us, the Special Rapporteur on the Freedom of Religion and Belief, and also uh, Ms. Diana Lai from the Baha'i International, representative of the Baha'i International Community. Um, Mr. Ahmad Shahid, Special Rapporteur in Iran, said in his report uh, that the Iranian government's lack of investigation and redress generally fosters a culture of impunity, further weakening the impact of the human rights instruments Iran has ratified. Uh, this report documents acts of violence uh, that have been perpetrated against uh, Baha'i individuals, their home properties, and uh, places of work, uh, and, uh, and acts that have been taking place with complete impunity. Um, I'm going to give the floor now to Ms. Alayi, who will uh, speak about the report, and then to Mr. Bill. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to everyone, and welcome to Professor Bielefeld. Thank you for being uh, with us for this report. Last year, if you recall, um, the Baha'i International Community launched also at the Human Rights Council session um, a report on, on, on incitement to um, hatred um, that was documenting um, for 16, the period of 16 months between late 2009 and mid uh, 2011, um, the fact that in the Baha'i, uh, in the Iranian um, media, um, whether it was press articles, um, actually 400 events that there were either press articles or films or s TV serials or speeches or seminars, um, web pages um, that were um, inciting hatred against the Baha'is and were in a way uh, demonizing uh, members of the Baha'i faith and the beliefs of the, of the Baha'is. Um, so, after having done this research, we found out that, in fact, um, followed, following this, um, this incitement and this media campaign, um, there was also uh, something that could be linked to acts of violence. And so we looked at the number of acts of violence um, also since that period, more or less since 2005. And we realized that firstly, um, there was of course what is much better documented, which is the official persecution, the persecution that is um, done by the government itself uh, against the Baha'is. Um, since 2005, more than <coughs> 60, 660 Baha'is have been arrested. Today, there's still about 100 to 110 of them that are in prison. 60, 53 of them have already served sentences. And uh, 140 are out on appeals or are, are, are waiting to be called to serve their sentences. And two, 280 are awaiting their trial. Um, so this is a really a very large number of individuals who are just um, in prison, um, either in prison or in some form of judicial process um, simply because of their beliefs. Um, what we have also been able to document in this report is um, uh, the fact that during the arrests, um, the raids on the homes of people, um, there was there have been violence. Um, I can even such great violence in the middle of the night. People who are masked and attack homes that children have been actually small children whose parents were arrested have been um, quite um, shocked and. Uh, has left an impact on them, this type of arrest. And just to say that Baha'is are not violent, and you know, if, if, if a police or if a group of individuals from the Ministry of Information, uh, which are the main people who arrest the Baha'is, uh, come to people's homes, it's not like they will uh, uh, react violently, so there is a need for that, for that violence. And there has also been, um, in prison then, uh, something that is common, of course, to all prisoners of conscience. It's not only Baha'is, unfortunately, in Iran, uh, is torture, uh, beating, and prolonged solitary confinement. So these are the, um, these, this is the situation of the, um, that you will find in this report of the Baha'is who have been imprisoned, I would say, officially. 
And then um, another part of this report presents um, another form of attacks on Baha'is, which is in some ways, I would say almost more alarming because it is following this media campaign, this, um, this uh, demonizing campaign against the Baha'is, and which are the acts that, are, uh, that take place through civil, civil people. Generally, the sense is that, and I will come to it, that it's not from the population at all, and that it is mainly um, uh, acts that are orchestrated. <laughs> But in any case, these acts, and the, you will see also in the reports how they are, um, um, how, how we can categorize them, uh, some go always almost range to murder, you know, Baha'is have been murdered, other, uh, or have received death threats through letters, through repeated phone calls or repeated text messages, and, um, and this has been... Um, uh, a campaign against the Baha'is. There have been also physical assaults of Baha'is um, just in the streets. Uh, people have been ki kidnapped, uh, taken to places, and beaten, interrogated for a number of days um, by unknown in entities, individuals. So they're not people who identify themselves as people who have some form of, um, of connection with the government, although we believe they do. Um, and um, and also cases where you see that people have been actually threatened in the street uh, with knives or trying to be uh, attached to a tree and burnt, etc., etc. You the details are in the report. I'm not going to go through all this. So basically, physical assaults by individuals. And then there have been attacks on properties. So arsons of Baha'i homes. Attacks. Uh, Demolition by bulldozers, and I would like to focus on the on, on, on the means also of these demolitions because you know it can't just be you know if you're a person who has who has who has um, ill intention and uh, is just an individual, it's not so easy to get a hold of a bulldozer and go and bulldoze the home of a Baha'i just like that. Uh, sometimes the attack on properties have been actually. In Villages, and I think the most known cases that some of you have heard of, uh, which was probably the most outrageous because of the sheer number of the homes that were destroyed, was the attack that happened in a village of Ivel um, in Iran, where 50 homes of Baha'is um, were bulldozed um, in, a, in a widespread uh, attack. This will find also all the information uh, in the report. And then these attacks, uh, I think, have two other dimensions that are quite um, even more troublesome. And it's attacks on school children. Because, you know, there's one thing of, of threatening adults, and there's another of uh, punishing children just because of their belief, humiliating them in front of their schoolmates expelling them from the school because they're Baha'is, trying to register and find lists of all the, the Baha'i school children in order to know who they are and how to identify them, ostracizing them, um, uh, you know, telling the children not to, the other children not to play with them, and this from a very young age, and even beating them physically. Um, and you know, already physical assault of a child is, um, is quite uh, horrendous, but when it comes from somebody also who is your teacher, so who has an authority, is even you know is even increases that that form of of uh, of, uh, of horror that uh, that these acts are are are, are uh, done simply because of a child's religious belief, or rather even his or her parents' religious beliefs. And then the other one that is also very disturbing is that there is no protection even after death, because whole Baha'i cemeteries, this is also in the report, have been bulldozed. And again, um, I will come back to, this is a good way of me coming back to bulldozer, because what we were, were talking about when we say with impunity, is that we have yet to find one case that has been uh, properly um, uh, followed uh, by the courts. And uh, this is the main situation 
that uh, the Baha'is in Iran face is that either these crimes or these attacks um, are conducted by officials of the government in civilian clothes and so of course they face total impunity because in fact it is not something that is just generated by some uh, some people who are who have hatred or have prejudice or um, uh, against the Baha'is but rather that they are covering up um, by agents of the Iranian government in plain clothes or even if it is a group of people who, for one reason or another, um, that is based, of course, on religious beliefs, have something against the Baha'is, they know that they can do that with total impunity. How can you take bulldozers and demolish 50 homes or demolish a whole cemetery in a night um, without the authorities even being aware of that or without the authorities you know, being able to stop that at some point? And even, let's imagine that it is possible to do that, then how, why isn't the government prosecuting these attacks? Why is it possible for any Iranian to just decide, I'm going to go and burn the house of a Baha'is because I don't like these people because they're Baha'is, or because for other reasons? So why, isn't, why is, are these attacks on Baha'is um, faced with total impunity on the part of the government, and that the government doesn't respect its... Um, international engagement and, and, and uh, you know that Iran is not only a member of the United Nations and should, uh, should respect freedom of religion or belief, but it is also a signatory of the Covenant on Civil and Political. So um, this is a, a brief, um, and then of course we have also at the end of the report a, a list of all the attacks that we have been able to document. So we hope that um, with this report uh, we will be able to create further awareness um, an awareness that is also very much um, uh, created thanks to the reports of the Special Rapporteurs, uh, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief and the Special Rapporteur on Iran. And, uh, and we hope that also the international community will, uh, will give a message, a loud and clear message to the Iranian government that these <coughs> violations of freedom of religion and belief against the Baha'is and of course against all other uh, religious minorities uh, are just unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll give the floor to Mr. Bielefeld now and then we'll have some time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll give the floor to Mr. Bielefeld now and then we'll have some time for questions. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to also play a certain role in this launching of a new report which I was able to read beforehand. For me it's completely clear that I will come to such an event uh, because uh, there is no denying that the persecution of the Baha'is is one of the worst. I mean, both on the, on the level of the facts, it's clearly documented. This is just another documentation, not the first. But it's good to have in-depth analysis and a clear account of the facts. And also, I mean, on the normative level, in this case, it doesn't require any subtle normative analysis. It's just self -evident. So what I can do is not much more than echo what Diana said before. I will do that. Uh, and uh, first of all, let me say the following. I just come from my presentation of the annual report, which had a focus on minorities, religious minorities. And in the report, there's also a phenomenology of different patterns of violations. And you will, if you go through the list of various minorities, you will see one minority suffers from this and another minority from that. Some suffer from lack of official recognition, others suffer from societal prejudices, and this and that. The Baha'is suffer from all elements of that phenomenology. All. Across the board. Uh, and that's why it, it's really one of the of the most obvious cases of state persecution in particular. I mean, there is also the societal dimension, but it's basically state persecution systematic and co covering all areas of state activities, the various systems from family law uh, uh, provisions to schooling, education, security. Now, let me echo uh, what Diane has presented a few minutes ago by going through
through uh, the life of an individual. I mean, just imagine what it means growing up in a society that expresses such degrees of hostility, especially in the state and its institutions. Just what, what it, imagine, imagine what that means for a child in school, maybe even in kindergarten. Sometimes it even starts in the preschool phase of human life. To be exposed to a stigma, to be told there's something wrong with your family, you have to change, you have to adapt. The, the public humiliation procedures that you mentioned before, just imagine what that means for the mindset of a child growing up in such a society. Then if the child becomes, gets the age of higher education. Now, the problem is how to get access to higher education. I mean, we have lots of cases in which Baha'is have been expelled from university education or other sectors of higher education. And, I mean, it's well known that the Baha'is have tried to cope with that by establishing their own alternative education systems in a completely hostile environment. Then, uh, imagine what it means if a person wants to get a position uh, in life, to get a job. Yeah, some jobs are reserved for others. I mean, Baha'is are excluded. I mean, there's not the slightest possibility for Baha'i to take a position in any public sector. But even in the private sector, I mean, there is uh, uh, mobbing, uh, stigmatization, so that even affects the private sector. So how can a person even start a life? A profession. How can a person start a family life if family law is denominational and there's no space, official space at least, for Baha'is to conclude valid marriages? What, I mean, all this, what it implies for uh, inheritance claims, for rights to custody, there is an element of precariousness uh, uh, with, all, with, with lots of implications uh, very, on very important dimensions of human life. And then hostility even in terms of uh, violent attacks, uh, mob violence, in a climate of impunity, all this documented also in, in this new uh, documentation, and uh, criminalization by the state. So one, not only do the Baha'is have to expect lack of protection, I mean, government agencies very often behave like inimical, hostile forces. And now, what, mean, what, what does it mean if then a person finally has started a family life knowing that their children will be exposed to the same thing? With all these dangers that children are alienated from their families. And it doesn't even stop with a person's death because then we have uh, the experience of desecration of cemeteries, uh, as you said it earlier, cemeteries being also bulldozed down by someone, and no one knows who it was, but these cases hardly ever uh, receive public attention or a sort of <coughs> public remedies. Uh, that has never existed before. I found a very small silver lining in the report, uh, something that surprised me, and uh, it's the it's an act of solidarity uh, that the village population, in one or two cases, obviously has protected their Baha'is against attacks. One would think this is just normal, decent behavior. But in a climate of systematic hostility, one should not underestimate the courage that it requires for the village population to defend their Baha'is. I mean, the fact that this has occurred, probably as an exception, but it has occurred. I would like to know more about it. I mean, it gives a little hope uh, that for all the repression that Baha'is experience, there is still a chance also for finding a place in a future Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Are there any questions? No questions. Because it's so obvious. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So obvious. Yeah. Perhaps while you um, you digest what has been <laughs> said and, and maybe questions come to your mind, 
I just wanted to add something to, to, to what Professor Bielefeld has said now. I think um, that is not in this report, but maybe I could say the case that you mentioned is actually the case of a home that was going to be uh, uh, destroyed, and the neighbors came to the to the rescue of the family because they were uh, they, they didn't find it acceptable at all. Um, I think that we have other cases. I think it's in the city of Semnon, which has been a city we've also produced a report on particular attacks with that city because it's a it's a town where there has been focus uh, on on attacks where um, actually some of the uh, people have written letters to the municipality and, and said that, you know, we don't understand why you are attacking the Baha'is because, you know, they, we have been doing business with them. They're, they're, they're you know, people who are very uh, trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's sort of a petition, you know, and that whatever you're doing is actually bringing a bad name on, on our town because, you know, because it, 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 it's such a, an attack on the Baha'is. So, and uh, there was another case, I'm not quite sure it's in this report, but where um, students, when the Baha'i, actually the, the denial of access to education for the Baha'is um, is such today, access to higher education is such that Baha'is can, some Baha'is, not all, but some Baha'is, if they're not yet identified as Baha'is, can enter Iranian universities. But as soon as they're identified as Baha'is, then they're expelled. So there was a case of a Baha'i who had been able to enter the university, and, uh, and at the time of the final exam, or some exam of, you know, maybe not the final final, but of that year, exam was then denied the access to sit in for the exam, because in the meantime, it was recognized that, um, that I think it was a he, but I'm not sure was a Baha'i. And all the, I think, three or 400 fellow students refused to sit in the exam, saying that, you know, if he or she cannot sit, then we will not sit either. Which I think is a remarkable sign. It's, it's, a, it's a two-pronged. The, the first is that it's a sign that uh, the Iranians, the, the Iranian people, uh, have nothing against the Baha'is who are also Iranian people. <laughs> you know, there is no difference between an Iranian Baha'i and an Iranian Muslim or an Iranian Jew or an Iranian Zoroastrian or an Iranian Christian, but, um, but also that in fact this defamation campaign that the Iranian government is trying to create for sure has some effect. There is no doubt that it has because it's impossible that a campaign that is orchestrated by a government wouldn't have an effect, but it probably doesn't have the effect, as great an effect as the government would like it to have, which is also very re reassuring because it shows that there is more humanity into people in general and therefore Iranians as well. Than, uh, than all the, propag the negative propaganda. And I think it's, in a way, it's a good sign for all violations of freedom of religion or belief. Mm -hmm. Derek Brett, International Fellowship of Reconciliation. It occurs to me just to ask uh, whether the Baha'i community in Iran today uh, are basically all born Baha'i or whether there are converts um, amongst them, presumably to repression. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Hassan Nari Fashan from Sudan. Uh, I want to know uh, how, how can uh, Professor Lippert uh, cooperate with uh, Dr. Ahmed Shahid, the Special Rapporteur of Iran, and how effective is it just now? <coughs> okay. We had a productive meeting, the Special Rapporteur on Iran and uh, myself. Uh, we, not surprisingly, agreed on many findings, I would say virtually all uh, substantive issues. Uh, uh, so that cooperation is there in terms of an exchange of, uh, of, of opinion, of assessments. Um, of course, one always would like to see much, much more. And uh, unfortunately, we are, we are confronted with limitations of what we can do, in particular in the very tough cases. That should not prevent us to do what we can and also to, to, to try to find more ways, maybe also more creative ways. Uh, 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 but I mean, without a minimum of cooperation from the side of, of the government, it's difficult. I mean, you can't 
um, you can't change a society from outside. But the minimum that we have to do and will continue to do is put pressure on the government. As, uh, as it was said before, Iran is signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, there's no denying that the treatment of the Baha'is, I mean, it's just a slap in the face of anything you, imaginable in the context of freedom of religion. It's so obvious. I mean, it really doesn't require a subtle analysis. And so it's important to raise awareness. I mean, there is a lot of awareness about, about, in general, I would say, within the human rights community about the situation of the Baha'is. But we have to bring it up again and again, and, and even being repetitive on it. I mean, in, order, in order not to, to let it happen that people get used to it, it remains completely in contradiction with anything that freedom of religion or belief uh, requires from the government. It's so obvious. Uh, so, and that's something in which Ahmed Shahid and myself, we completely agree. Uh, but I would be glad if we could do more, of course. Thank you. Um, just to respond to Derek's um, uh, question and not to go too into too much theology and theological uh, responses, because as a Baha'i, you have to make your own uh, spiritual choice, and that you have to do at the age of 15. Mm -hmm. So children are, of course, born in Baha'i families, and they will receive religious education, but they have to make their own decision at the age of 15, and some decide to be Baha'is, and some decide not to be Baha'is. Um, but, um, and, and there's another uh, principle in, in the Baha'i faith, which is that we're not allowed to proselytize. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have a spiritual duty to uh, respond to queries when people want to know about the Baha'i faith. So I think that this is a, a, a line that is quite sometimes different from others, but in any case, my understanding is that in Iran, uh, the Iranian Baha'is are responding, and there is more and more curiosity, in fact, because in a way, the fact that there is such um, an, an attack on, on Baha'is. There is a curiosity also on the part of people who are not Baha'is to know what this Baha'i faith is all about that doesn't allow your children to go to university, doesn't allow you to have a work, puts you into prison, etc., etc. And I would assume, I don't have uh, information, but I would assume that therefore there are also people who will, who will then choose to become Baha'i. But of course, given the circumstances in Iran, <coughs> it's very difficult um, for us to estimate any of these because um, it would put in danger. Because as you know also, um, and the special rapporteur may be able to, 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 to go further on this, um, um, uh, apostasy is, is punishable in Iran. Um, and it's, it can even be punished by the death penalty in cases. So I think it is a situation which people, if they do wish to change their faith, then would be subject to, uh, to you know, uh, prosecution that could, uh, could, to, could take their lives from them. Yeah. That apostasy issue is more complicated when, uh, than one might think. Because, uh, as you say, uh, we have seen apostasy charges. I mean, that people have been sentenced to death because of apostasy, because of having left Islam, having replaced Islam by another religion. So it is a reality. It's part of the jurisdiction, of the actual jurisdiction. But as far as I recall, a few years ago, um, a bill was discussed in Parliament about making it a formal crime because it's not within the written criminal code. And that interestingly failed. So we still have the reality, and not only the reality, also the normative framework of treating apostates as criminals, but the attempt to turn that into a formal law interestingly failed, which is somehow telling, if you ask me what precisely it tells, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But it's telling. And I would say it, it has a positive story, which I don't fully understand. 
could I ask what effect this massive discrimination has had on the actual demography of Baha'is in Iran? Um, has the population remained <coughs> relatively stable despite all of this? Or is there, in fact, um, an opportunity for some people at least to leave? And if so, how many are leaving? And then what happens to them when they ask maybe for asylum? What is the pattern of um, acceptance or refusal of asylum claims of Baha'is? Thank you, Edward Flynn, Viva International. My question is about access to education. And you say there is discrimination with regard to access at university level. Does this also imply that as a community you are not able to establish educational institutions? I guess both questions are a little bit more to me. Um, so I think your question, John, is um, is quite, in some ways, it's difficult for me to answer uh, based on the same thing that, uh, I mean, in numbers, huh? uh, because based on the same thing that it's very difficult for us to have any, any form of number coming out of Iran. But I have to state, first and foremost, that Baha'is want to be able, Iranian Baha'is want to be able to contribute to the betterment of their country. <coughs> and they are doing so at the moment. So it's not just a wishful thinking commitment, it's a commitment in practice. And so therefore, the majority of Baha'is, the large majority of Baha'is, wish to be able to remain in Iran and don't wish any more rights than anybody else. So it's not a question of acquiring privileges, but they want to be just like any other Iranian that can contribute to the betterment of his or her country while having his own religious beliefs and being able to practice them as well. So it's not just something in your heart and at home, but also being able to practice them freely. Because I think there is no distinction between inner and outer you know, beliefs. That some, that I think in, in some ways the Iranian government would like to actually create. Secondly, there is no apostasy in the Baha'i faith. So if you wish to leave the Baha'i faith, you can. And as I mentioned, there are children who are born in Baha'i families who decide not to be Baha'i. I don't think it's a large number either, but I'm sure that there are some, you know? That's the second thing. Thirdly, there are, of course, Baha'is who then decide under whatever pressure it is because, you know, if their life is threatened or if they don't have any means of, because, you know, if you, if you can't study and then you can't have a job, you know, at one point, you know, you're a little bit strangulated, if not a lot. So there are some people who also decide to leave. And, um, and there are some Baha'is who are particularly in, in <coughs> Turkey, in uh, refugee camps, uh, and they're trying to get refugee status. UNHCR, I think thanks to also all the reports from the special rapporteurs and from the UN, you know, uh, Professor Bielefeld, his predecessors, um, uh, Dr. Shahid, his predecessor, you know, there is, because as, as, as uh, the special rapporteur mentioned, there is a, a very well recognized pattern of religious persecution of the Baha'is. So the UNHCR actually uh, accepts the Baha'is without any difficulties as refugees. Then, of course, is the question of resettlement, which is a question that is for all refugees nowadays, which is a, a, another difficult situation. Um, to answer to your question, you know, we're not there at all. I mean, um, at, at this moment, um, the Baha'i, in the Baha'i faith, there is no clergy. And the Baha'is have uh, uh, elect their governing councils uh, at the local, national, and international level. Um, at the beginning of the Islamic Revolution, the Iranian government announced that these um, uh, councils would be uh, illegal. And the Baha'is, because there's also a principle of obeying to, to your government in the Baha'i faith, the Baha'is have decided that they will abide because this is not one of their, the red line of our, of our faith, you know? We have some uh, beliefs that we cannot uh, not uh, implement, you know? There are some things that we will not accept regardless of what the government <coughs> says, you know? But there are some that we, we can. And they, the Baha'is of Iran decided that, you know, not having an institution was not one of the core tenets of their faith, that they could not, um, uh, you know, uh, they, could, they could not, do without, and so therefore they accepted to not have these behind institutions. But after a while, 
they realized that, you know, when you need somebody to manage the affairs of the community, you need somebody to take care of marriages, divorces, <coughs> you know, the, the, the activities for the betterment of, of the community, the activities for the betterment of society, etc., etc. And so there was an ad hoc group that was formed, and this called the Yaran. And these seven people, humans, so they have been incarcerated for over five years, and they have been given the longest sentence for prisoners of conscience in Iran. So there is no prisoner of conscience, whether political or non-political, they've been condemned to 20 years imprisonment. One of them is way into his 70s, which means that if the, the prison sentence is, you know, it takes place, he will die in prison. So um, uh, I think that just to show you the extent to which Baha'is cannot have any form of you know, religious activity, let alone any form of <laughs> religious institution of schooling or whatever. However, the Baha'is, as Heiner mentioned, have been trying to give higher education to their children. And there was an institution that was very grassroots and started, you know, just because people wanted to have um, 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 their children be, being able to have access to, to <coughs> higher education. So they started what is called the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. And also that faced a number of crackdown. The more recent was last year, when a number of the people who were facilitating these very sort of home, you know, home distance learning uh, education, that was of good quality. My understanding is that you know they were having then you know uh, the, the the possibility those students to go abroad and continue their their their, their studies, but uh, but it was very sort of at home, and. Um, and, this, um, and, and these people, I think now 10 of them, are in prison, um, including uh, both parents, uh, you know, a husband and wife, which leaves their child uh, without any uh, parental uh, supervision and has to, to stay with the, the grandmother. Maybe if I can add, uh, yeah, just uh, one little um, addition to the question of asylum raised by John Taylor. Uh, as it was said, uh, generally Baha'i, uh, I mean the, the Baha'i persecution is so well known that uh, many people don't have the typical difficulties that refugees are faced with when trying to apply for asylum. But there are exceptions unfortunately. Also in Europe and um, uh, last year I conducted a country visit to Cyprus with different findings. And one finding was uh, that there have been uh, Baha'is expelled from the country to Iran. And, and it is in one case, it had been a Baha'i, uh, uh, I mean, who had practiced Baha'i faith before arriving in Cyprus. The other cases, and, and that, that is a pattern uh, uh, that you find in many countries, if people change their beliefs after handing in uh, asylum uh, submissions, uh, 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 asylum applications, that is often treated with suspicion. Even if these people claim that they had practiced their faith maybe clandestinely before, mm -hmm. but it's treated with suspicion. That's one aspect I think that also requires additional attention. But one case, it was a clear case that uh, this person had practiced openly Baha'i faith before, nevertheless was deported back to Iran. So it happens. Go ahead. Yes. Bonjour. Uh, excuse me for my very bad language in English. Can I ask my question in another language? Mm -hmm. uh, Italian yes. or Farsi? Yes. Farsi, Farsi. Farsi. Okay. <laughs> خیلی ممنونم ازتون از اون میخوام نمیتونم به زبان انگلیسی صحبت کنم رژیم جمهوری اسلامی از بعد به پیدایشش تا الان در حدود 250 نفر اپوزیسیون ها در خارج از کشور به قطع رسونده با این مسائلی که اتفاق افتاده من میخوام از شما جامعه باهایی بدانم در چه وضعیتی از نظر روانی از اونجا که شما اکثر انسان هایی که خارج از کشور هستن باهایی uh, just to translate, uh, he said that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran 
uh, has killed more than 250 people uh, in the last 30 years, and he's asking outside of Iran, and he's asking about the psychological effects um, of these killings on, on Baha'is. Um, it is very difficult for me to answer your question because I don't think that we have done any research on that. So it would be a completely empirical approach without any, you know, any scientific um, um, basis. But I think that um, uh, Baha'is are just Iranians like all Iranians, and so they suffer in the same manner from being away from their homeland, from you know, not being able to be in contact with their relatives, not being able to to maybe have their profession, you know, just like any other Iranian that has to live outside of Iran for, you know, reasons of belief, whether they're political or other um, opinion, I would say that. But, um, but, uh, but I think that there is, um, uh, I, I've read uh, some research about um, uh, uh, people who have suffered torture in prison and how the fact that there is a community to welcome you and to support you and the support of a community actually helps you to overcome issues of, you know, of having been tortured and then, and then live in, a, in another country. And I think that perhaps for the Baha'is, they ha there is a community because there are Baha'i communities everywhere and these are not only Iranians, they are you know, Baha'is from all, all, co all countries that welcome um, um, the, the, the Baha'is who come from Iran and so I think that perhaps this may be something that could help um, uh, the difficulty of having to leave the country that you want to be in, basically, um, that is your home, that, you, that you're your home, and that you want to to contribute to the well-being of. <coughs> of course, um, I think I don't want to go into too much Bahá'ís, but also we, as Bahá'ís, we believe in healthy nationalism. So therefore, we also think that if we cannot contribute to the well-being of our own country, we still can contribute to the well-being of the country that we live in. So it is not something that actually closes you up as a community that is completely closed and wants just to return, but also allows you to uh, perhaps um, uh, feel that you're still contributing and still part of the society in which that you have emigrated. So. Are there any other questions or comments? Special Rapporteur has to leave in, in about five minutes, so if there's any questions to him specifically, go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for the fantastic presentation. I just have, oh, sorry, my name is Scott Sharon from the University of Essex. Um, I have a question and a comment. Um, the question is, um, the Special Rapporteur, you mentioned you know, the desirability of trying to find more things to do or creative ideas. And I wondered whether you know you had any thoughts on what those things might be. And I also had a question of whether you felt that the special rapporteurs were able to engage enough on individual cases of Baha'is, you know, through urgent appeals and other you know, uh, methods. Um, and the comment I wanted to make was just on this question of apostasy, um, about it not being in the criminal code or in the penal code. Um, it does, that doesn't necessarily mean <coughs> that it's just a practice. Uh, you know, I think there's a pretty good argument. Actually, it is part of the law of Iran because the, the yeah, I mean, the relevant penal code and the criminal procedure basically incorporates the Sharia, and you know where there is not a ruling on the matter. And in the Pasta Nadakani case, it was argued to the Supreme Court in 2011 that um, apostasy was not a crime and the Supreme Court rejected that argument. So actually it is part of the law, it's just yes. not obviously part of the law. Um, so I look forward to hearing um, yeah. your comments. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, to start with the easier part, <laughs> in, uh, of course you are perfectly right, it remains part of the jurisdictional system, so law in that sense. And it's actually applied. We have a number of cases. You mentioned the case of Pastor Nadakani, who finally was relieved, but this is only one case. Yeah. So. Apostasy law exists. Nevertheless, I mean, it struck me as uh, somehow indicating, indicating, let's say, some ambivalences uh, that the project of enshrining that in a formal law failed. In part. <coughs> so you are right, nevertheless. I mean, no doubt about that. Uh, now, what 
can be done. I always, I mean, when, when, when I'm being asked what I can do as special rapporteur, I'm inclined to say nothing, which is wrong. Uh, but um, the positive answer, it's in collaboration with many actors. Then one can make a difference. It's only by forging broad alliances, by receiving support from people who, I mean, have information, but have also their capacities, that one can make a little difference. I do what I can, and I, I, I feel quite passionate about the man. I try to explore all the possibilities. Um, as you know, uh, I, I'm saying it anyway, rapporteurs do their job pro bono, so everyone has to, 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 to fulfill other duties, most of us uh, as university teachers, which is also the case with me. So I have my five weekly courses, so not enormous workload, yeah. So I'm under siege by students and then exposed to the demands of that wonderful mandate. I really love a mandate. And uh, all the potential that is there. Um, and you mentioned individual cases. I mean, that's, it's good uh, to, to take that up uh, because it's, I would say it's publicly not that well known. People know about country visits from time to time, but right? oh, there are constraints, uh, financial restraints, time constraints. Then of thematic uh, 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 projects, thematic reports, they are an important element. But then the, one should not forget what I personally even call the backbone of the mandate, individual cases individual cases uh, uh, on which uh, rapporteurs can act in their own specific ways and that their, their specific the specific specificities of no, got it. the specificities are it's first of all confidential in a certain, within a certain time frame that allows taking up cases when, before the fact finding has been finished, I mean that one can re, re, uh, react quite quickly, very quickly. Uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, other uh, organizations. Once the facts have been established, and then they can decide, okay, we act on it. Uh, rapporteurs can act earlier, because I mean, in a way, we play the ball into the field of the government, saying the government is in charge, also of establishing the facts once. Uh, the case has uh, reached a certain plausibility threshold, but that's a flexible threshold. So one can act rapidly. And uh, as I said, uh, the specific features include that phase of confidentiality, but it's only a phase. After 60 days, that is exhausted, and three times a year, the, the whole uh, range of communications is made public. <coughs> It's made publicly available so that also NGOs and others can act on it. And it's a possibility then to also take some cases on the record of the United Nations. I mean, it's really a low threshold approach. And then one can also make use of those cases in, in other documents, like for instance in the minority uh, report, uh, the religious minority report that I've just presented. I mean, that also refers to cases that we have worked upon earlier. Uh, and so uh, there is a potential, but nevertheless, I mean, the, the, uh, the important message is, in order to make a difference, what we need is very broad alliances. Rapporteurs, they have an enhanced position, but very little infrastructure. I mean, there's a little infrastructure in the OHCHR, but it's small. I mean, very committed people without whom we would, I would lack one hand, one foot, half of my brain, half of my tongue, I would know, yes? Yeah? So, my ears wouldn't work properly. So that is very valuable, but it's quite limited. It's one person, a country, there's Brenda working on behalf of my mandate, plus another mandate. Yeah? So it's, it's pretty limited. One should be aware. But then, uh, of course, one has to explore the possibilities, the positive possibilities. But my message is it can only be done in conjunction with broad alliances. And that's why, for instance, I'm also looking forward to other side events, including the NGO meeting we are going to, to, to have on, on Thursday. I mean, that's what really matters. I mean, to forge broad alliances and also to work with these alliances. I mean, uh, that's more than just the exchange of business cards and email addresses. Uh, so that really the message is made available, uh, gets to the right channels and uh, and that we have to, but I'm always open to also ideas of what can be done more. 
Yeah? Because I, I suffer from the limitedness of what we can do, especially if we are confronted with the tough cases. Yeah? I mean, if it's with the, handling cases with the government that is somehow willing to cooperate, that's much more productive. But a government like the Iranian government, yeah, that turns a deaf ear to all this, yeah, oh, what to do, what to do, beyond the necessary awareness raising. I mean, that we have to continue to do, of course, yeah, but what, can we, what more can be done? You know, I, 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 I would be interested at, uh, to, to, to get more ideas, and uh, maybe in the NGO meeting, we can also explore that further. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, I have to run to the next yeah. side event. I have a couple of side events in succession. Session. Yes. Thank you so much. I wish you a good continuation, yeah, and good reception of the important report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't think we have any more time for questions, uh, but thank you, everyone, again, and uh, have a great.